Hi all, I'm Libby, proud captain of Millwall Lionesses. Thank you to our Millwall fan show from the No One Likes Us Talking team for sponsoring me this year. Make sure you give them a listen like I do. Or even better, why not sponsor a lioness while you're at it like they do? Thank you always for your continued support. This podcast is a proud member of the Fan Hub 100. Football without fans is nothing, so we've partnered with Fan Hub to put fans first. Search Fan Hub app to play your part in the journey. Hi, I'm Bethany Warren, and you are joining me to listen to the podcast of our Millwall fan show with the No One Likes Us Talking team, which is available every Friday at 8 pm. It's the 13th show of COVID 19 in lockdown 3.0 here in England. I'm your host, Gary Staff, and I have the No One Likes Us Talking team of Patricia Maslin, Dave Hart, and Henry Morgan. Not everybody likes them, but they don't care. Right, firstly, before I turn to the panel, there is an urgent request. The Lions Food Hub, based in Rennie and Manor Estate Tenants and Residents Association Hall in Bermondsey, are looking for food and financial support. One way to help them, you can find the Lions Food Hub on Twitter and Facebook or enter Lions Food Hub Banquet, that's B A N. K U E T in your browser and make a one off or regular donation. Okay, so let's try and help everyone on that. But without further ado, we need to speak about Swansea. So, unfortunately, Pat, I'm going to start with you with that oh. one. <laughs> I really wish I hadn't bothered. Um, I, must admit, <laughs> I must admit, I turned it off after the second goal. I mean, I don't think we deserve to lose 3 0, but. It, it was yeah, it was hard pill to swallow. They were far better than us. Um, I don't know. It's just towards the end of the season. I you know I know a few people thought we could make the playoffs, which was a bit of a wild fantasy, I think. But <laughs> I I think we're just playing out the season now. It's there's there's not a lot to talk about. I mean, it was nice to get the players back. Quite a few off who had been off injured, but. Um, yeah, I just hope he starts playing some of the youngsters now. We're in a position where nothing can really happen. Well, interesting you say that, Pat. Most of them seem to be going out on loan. Right? Well, it's been about well, five the, this week. Well, that's because the under twenty threes have only got two games left, and these um, the nation national league have still got eleven games. So I think those going oh, out good. are going to get more more game time. Yeah, it could be interesting for Sutton. I know they've got one or two of our players, and Barnet recently they're making some good uh, plays down in the uh, uh, conference, as was I think at the moment. Yeah. So uh, good, good luck to them. And well, could you imagine Sutton in the first in the uh, second division? That'd be interesting. Wow, well, be great. Yeah, Dave, over to you. Oh, Swansea. Uh, well, yeah, as it wasn't, it wasn't a three 0 as Pat said. It's one of those games. No, I agree. That, I said that on the. Uh... But uh, to me, that the key, the key point of the game was when Danny Mac was taken off and they brought Marlon Romeo on. Now I've never run Romeo down, but he he didn't have Jamal Lowe under control like Danny Mac did, and two goals. Yeah, agreed. Um, did they actually score both them goals after he went off? Yes, they did. Yeah. <clears throat> Yeah. So I'm not. I don't like to blame people, but you can see that mm. there was a difference. Uh, you know, Danny Mac had Jamal Lowe kept him quiet most of the game, but their main man, are you, uh, class striker? They paid a lot of money for him, so you know that's something we lack. Uh, good striker, strike partners, people that are going to score goals week in, week out. You know, we're twenty goals light this year. That's our problem. Definitely. Yeah. And Henry? Well, I mean, uh, yeah, they. As, I just I agree with everything that Pat said. Um, I, I just think they, yeah, they, they, you know, they looked so much more composed. I think Bill Clark said actually that they usually do have a lot of possession, Swansea, um, but they certainly didn't look like a team that hadn't won for. Five games, you know what I mean? They, they they came in and they just had a, a game plan. And I think, you know, if they don't score before the break and it's nil-nil going in at half-time, is it a different 
game, quite possibly. Um, I, I personally, I, I think Mason Bennett was more to blame for the second goal than Marlon Romeo. I thought Romeo probably didn't do very well for the third goal. I didn't actually think Danny Mack had a great first half. I thought he gave the ball away a couple of times, some of his passing up to Jed Wallace. I mean, Wallace was just trying to make blind runs and wasn't really helping him out. But I don't really think anyone stood out that, that much, really, um, either way. But, you know, it is what it is. Um, and and I think, unfortunately to me, Marlon Romeo looks like a player that's probably on his way in the summer, um, given all the background and everything that's happened this season. He just looks a bit defeated, which is a shame because he's a good, young, energetic, strong footballer. Um, but yeah, no, I, same as Pat as well. After the second goal went in, I was like, I've had enough of I follow this season. I just can't be bothered to watch us, you know, get ground into the dirt. So I watched a couple of the highlights later. But yeah, bring in some youngsters, you know, well, let them get some experience at championship level, mm. move on to next year. Right, yeah, well, thanks for all your comments. Well, we'll take a break there and be back with our first guest this evening. But for now, let us listen to what the fantastic fanatics can offer our club. Hi, I'm Richard Gordon, and I'd like to invite you to become a fantastic fanatic. Fantastic Fanatics is a great way to raise funds for your sports club. Sign up today, find your club, and securely register your everyday debit and credit cards. Every time you spend with our retail partners, they pay a percentage back to your club. It costs you nothing, and you can win cash prizes along the way. Visit fantasticfanatics.com and help your club be the best it can be. I'm Gary Staff, and I am back with the No One Likes a Talking team of Patricia Maslin, Dave Hart, and Henry Morgan. My mate Reg signed up for Fantastic Fanatics online and he raised £17.50 for the club when we're new in his motor insurance. What a great return. So, our first guest tonight was born in Edmonton on the 20th of May 1980. He started his football career with Arsenal as a trainee. Before he had a chance to play for the Gunners, he was picked up by the Lions at the age of 19 in 1999 for a free of £30,000. Whilst playing for the Lions, he had a very illustrious career with highlights that include FA Cup Final, promotion to the first division, captain the club, played in the UEFA Cup against Ferris Faros. He left the Lions for Leeds for £250,000 plus £2,000 per game, up to a maximum of 100000 However, this was very short-lived, and after 10 days at Leeds, he joined Hull City for £500,000. He then went on to play for Oldham, Brighton, Luton, Barnet, and then uncovered his boots after a spell with Histon, who he then went on to manage for two more seasons. Millwall and Neil Harris then came knocking again and he joins the Lions youth setup. In 2015, the Lions sacked Ian Holloway and the manager job was given to Neil and our guest tonight. The pair managed the Lions for four seasons, which resulted in the Lions being promoted back to the Championship, a top eight finish and a few Premiership scalps along the way. The pair resigned in 2019 before moving on to manage Cardiff. We welcome to the show tonight an absolute Millwall legend. Welcome, Mr. David Livermore. How you doing? Good. I, and I need to go and get a drink after that. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome, Dave. So before I let you off with the team, David, I just want to ask you, um, how did the first move from Millwall to, uh, from Arsenal first come about? Hey? In a lot of ways, I was fortunate because I, I remember, um, it's a good little story actually, because I always played, I was brought up as a centre-back at Arsenal. Um, and the reserve team manager, Georgie Armstrong, always felt I took too many risks as a defender. So he put me in centre midfield. And I happened to play against Rhino and Macca in the same game. Um, I must have made an impression because they come back and watch the next two games after that. And one of them was against Tottenham, which I scored a goal in. The next game was against Crystal Palace and I scored two. Um, and off the back of them three games, I think they decided to sign me. Um, yeah, so that was, that was how I ended up moving on to, on to Millwall from Arsenal in, in 99. Hello, Dave. David, it's Pat here. Um, following on from Gary's question, when Mark McGee became manager, what changes did he make to build our promotion winning side? And also, what was it like working with the great Ray Hartford? Yeah, um, well, what, what we had at the time was we had obviously Mark McGee, who was a, a fantastic people's person. Um, he was very good, um, very good motivator. Um, very good in front of the press. Um, and then you had Ray Hartford, who was obviously um, 
a fantastic coach. Um, he obviously was assistant manager to Kenny Dalglish at Blackburn when they won the Premier League. So it was very fortunate to have Ray there. And we also had Steve Grit, who was a fantastic organiser. Um, so between the three of them, um, you know, you probably, if you rolled them into one person, you probably got the sort of modern days sort of Jurgen Klopp's and Pep Guardiola's really. Um, so no, Mark come in was very professional. Um, we did a lot of work. Uh, probably one of the first teams that I can remember where we had, um, you know, we brought in nutritionists that went on to work with the England rugby team that won the World Cup. Um, we had uh, Ben Stork, who was our fitness coach. So not only were we a young, uh, talented side with, with good experience in the team, but was also very fit uh, and probably a little bit ahead of our times because of uh, the infrastructure that Mark McGee put in place. Hi, David. It's uh, Dave here. Um, we can't not mention the FA Cup final and everything that surrounds it. Uh, Dennis Wise, Ray Wilkins... Old Trafford, Cardiff, etc. What were your main memories looking back on that? But obviously, look, the final was was a you know apart from the result was a was a fantastic occasion. But um, you know the semi final was obviously the game that I think hmm. will sort of live in the memory probably more <laughs> because the the prize was so huge, wasn't it? Um, hmm. You know, Absolutely. it wasn't only wasn't only an opportunity to get to an FA Cup final. It was also, you know, the opportunity to play in a European competition the the, the season after. Um, and I, Dave, I remember, yeah, sorry, sorry, Dave. I was going to ask actually. You talking about the final? Do you think if we'd have got to half time, would it have been a very different second half? Oh yeah, uh, possibly. I think, I think at some at some point, I'm sure United would have. Um, got the better of us at some point. Um, yeah, possibly. I think it was just. Um, I think it was probably inevitable that at some point, uh, with the quality that they had in the team, probably in the sort of the later stages of the game, um, that they probably would have gone on to win still. But yeah, who knows if we could have got to half time and maybe weathered the storm for fifteen minutes in the second half, we might have had more of an opportunity. But um, mm. you know, we're playing against world class players, weren't we? So. But, you know, fantastic, mm-hmm. Dave, I'm sure, for everyone. Yeah. Uh, hi, David. Henry here, mate. You left Mill after 273 games. And, and as we've just been discussing, like floodloads of memories, um, you, you left us to go to Leeds and then very quickly on to Hull. So mm-hmm. how did that move come about? And then why such a swift move on to Hull? It's, it's always difficult. I mean, I look back now and I, I probably committed one of the sins that you should never do as a, as a Millwall player and that's signed for Leeds United. <laughs> um, you know, so that, that probably wasn't the best idea of my career. But in, in, in fairness to me, um, you know, Leeds had just been beaten in the, in the Championship playoff final the season before against Watford. Yeah. Um, and obviously, Millwall had been relegated, unfortunately. Um, and I was always ambitious. I always wanted to play at the highest level I could. You know, yeah. I, I had ambitions of, of playing in the Premier League, which I never achieved. Um, yeah. So it was a hard situation for me not to turn down that opportunity. But yeah, you're right. I mean, 10 days. I mean, everyone asks me about that a lot. Um, I, the only way I can explain it, and I've, I've, I've met uh, Kevin Blackwell a few times since, who was the manager that signed me at Leeds. And I was kind of like fourth on their list of centre midfield players that they wanted to sign. Third or fourth, maybe third, I think yeah. he said. Yeah. Um, they wanted to sign Kevin Nichols and Ian Westlake, and, and neither of them were available. So they signed me. Uh, once they had signed me, within that 10 days, both Kevin Nichols and Ian Westlake were now available, and he wanted to sign them. So I'd gone from being sort of first choice, me and Sean Derry and sent in the field, to being yeah. potentially fourth choice. Um, so he just said to me, look, we've had an offer from Hull. Um, we've accepted it. It's, it's entirely up to you. Now, I've always was a player that, you know, I want to, I want to go out there and earn my wages. I don't want to be sitting on the bench, um, counting my money at the end of the month. I want to be out there playing and contributing. So for me, it was quite a simple decision. But if you're saying I'm not yeah. going to be in your plans or I'm going to have to work doubly hard to get in your team, then I'm going to go to Hull City and, and, and play. Um, and funny enough, that season is a great decision because we, we stayed <laughs> up. I say we, Hull stayed up and Leeds got relegated. So 
and the season after we the season after we got promoted promote to the Premier League. So sometimes these things, you know, have a funny yeah. way of working out. Yeah. 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 Um, 2012, you returned to the Den, David, as part of the youth team set up. Um, and then stepped up to assistant manager with Neil. What would you say was your greatest achievement as part of that management team? I think there, I think there's a few. I think, you know, I don't want to be critical of uh, the managers that sort of were in between sort of Kenny Jacket and and, and Neil. <laughs> oh yeah, do but... be. Mate, criticise well, away, mate. <laughs> okay. yeah, yeah, yeah. There's no, nothing yeah. to worry about in there, David. <laughs> nothing to worry about. Yeah, I know, but I, I know, I know how tough it is. It's you know, it's a tough job, but. Put it put it this way, I think the biggest achievement was probably getting the club back on the right track, you know, reconnecting the terraces to the pitch. Yeah. Obviously the two the two playoffs, you know, obviously winning one. Um the eighth place finish, you know. I funny enough, just because I've got a bit of time on my hands at the moment, um I I watched the I watched the Fulham game when we were sitting sick. Because ah. yeah. for whatever reason, that first thirty minutes of that game is probably one of my highlights because I thought for 30 minutes we scared the life out of Fulham. You know, we yeah. were we were yeah. on a 17 game 17 game unbeaten run. I think that yeah. was the the best run for 45 years. Fulham were 21 games unbeaten, and we had a real chance of finishing in the in the playoff spots in the championship. And for 30 minutes we scared the life out of them. And <coughs> I just thought the atmosphere in the stadium that day. Um, Certainly for that first 30 minutes was fantastic. And I thought the team were, were outstanding for 25, 30 minutes and were unfortunate not to be ahead. Um, George Savile had gold still out. Um, Which had never and then, Yeah, exactly. And then obviously Fulham went on and showed their, their class that they've got in their team. But yeah, it's loads of, you know, the FA Cup runs, you know, two quarter, quarter finals, mm. you know, very unfortunate not to get a semi final to a semi final, obviously losing to, to Brighton in the quarters. So, yeah, loads of great memories, but the the biggest one for me, and I'm sure Neil would say the same, is just getting the club back on the right footing and and, and moving in the right direction again. David, just a quick one actually on that. What was the feeling like in the dressing room after that Brighton game? I imagine Dave Martin was oh. a sick as a pig, wasn't he? Yeah, and do you know what? Dave Martin is honestly generally one of the best pros and nicest people in the game. So it's very, very unfortunate Um that that happened to him so late on. Um, I think, yeah, I think a lot of Millwall supporters forgave him um, yeah. eventually until yeah. he went and rejoined <laughs> West Ham. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I know, I know. Um, <laughs> but honestly, you know, but David is honestly, you would love him. He's, he's such a nice guy and a fantastic professional, probably one of the best that, that, that I've worked with. Um, and yeah, he was, he, obviously, he was gutted, you know, he was totally, totally gutted. He was. You know, what was we a, a, a few minutes away from from a semi final, but it was against Man City the semi final, so yeah, yeah. who knows? What the, <laughs> yeah. I can honestly memory. say I went to the, I went to the final Crickety. against Watford. For my sins, I went to the final because my father in law, and that was painful enough watching Watford get beat. Yeah. Let alone what we'd have had it done to us. <laughs> was, that, that, that was, was that five? Was that five? Wasn't it? Was that five? Six. 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 Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Mm. Wow. yeah. <laughs> Oh, I have to mention as well a highlight: Tottenham quarterfinal. Yeah, because yeah, okay. I'm, I'm 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 a Tottenham supporter, so you know I was brought up in Edmonton, as you mentioned earlier. We, you know, literally, I could hear the, as a, as a young boy, I could hear the the stadium from my back garden. Um, so for me, that was a not a fantastic day in terms of the result, but a fantastic day in terms of being at White Lane for the last ever FA Cup game to be held there. Mm. Um, you know, was pretty special to for me personally. David, you were recently interviewed in the South London Press and you talked about what was missing from the current Millwall side. Hmm. For those listeners that haven't read it, do you want to let us know what your thoughts were? Um, yeah, I, I think the article was um, with Toby Porter was more sort of reflecting on um, when we finished fourth in the championship and trying to find a bit of a comparison. Um, but yeah, if you was going to ask me what's missing from Mill today, um, 25 goals. That's, that's what's missing. Um, mm. and, and it's as simple as that. I mean, 
my my personal opinion, looking from the inside outside in, is that I think it's remarkable that Millwall have finished eighth, twenty first, mm. eighth, and have now got a chance of finishing in the top ten again. I mean, for for Millwall, yeah. I know we're an ambitious football club, and we, and everyone wants to get into the playoffs and get promoted to the Premier League. That's the ultimate goal. But for the club of Millwall size to be doing what they're still doing is absolutely remarkable. So yeah, twenty five goals is what's missing. You know, if if, if you look at um, how many goals Millwall have scored this season, because they're not conceding. Um, I, I think the top scorers, I think it's Brentford around sixty six goals, isn't it? And I think Millwall yeah. is around. 41 goals, is that correct? Something like that. So, yeah, 41. Yeah, so, yeah, Makes sense. simple as that. Simple as that, really. And that's that's where the money is, isn't it? I mean, that's that costs a lot of money, you know? So. It does. Mm. Um, talk, talking of those sorts of opinions, uh, David, is, is, would you like another crack at management or have you decided to take another path away from the game now? Um, in terms of myself being a manager or in terms of... of being an assistant manager, what's well? I, I mean, either. I mean, would you, would you, having seen what Neil Harris was, you know, involved in and the pressures he was under, is that is is the top job something that you'd want to do? Um, I I done it for a short spell at Histon, which was mm. we were in the uh, Conference National my first season, got relegated, um, okay. and in the we then put in the Conference North and. I thought we'd done fairly well with, with a relatively young team. And I, I really enjoyed it. Uh, I learnt loads. I would be able to do the job better if I was to do it today. Um, yeah. I never say never, but I don't feel the need to do that job at the moment. Um, I think the difference between a, sort of Neil and myself is that, I, you know, if, if I travel to, to watch a, a game with Neil, um, you know, we could spend three hours in the car and we might speak for 10 minutes of it because his phone just continuously rings, you know, mm. whether it's a, it's an agent, uh, whether it's a player, whether it's the chief exec. So it's a very demanding job and not just on Saturday for 90 minutes, but you know, it, it is 24 seven and, yeah. um, you know, I don't know whether really I'd want to take that on, you know, as a number two, uh, yeah, I go fair. in, I, I do my work, um, you know, I'm I'm there to answer my phone at any time of the day, but generally my phone won't ring until, you know, between the hours of five and eight o'clock next morning. You know, very rarely will my my phone ring. So, yeah, number number two is a nice job. It's a nice job. <laughs> Excellent. Well, lastly, before you go, David, um, it's edition of the show. Um, we've obviously got Brentford coming up at the new Brentford Community Stadium at the weekend. Um, mm. I think they're more or less. Um, assured of a playoff place now, but do you think Millwall might cause an upset at the weekend? Uh, I think Millwall can, yeah, can cause an upset against anyone. Um, yeah, uh, look, you, you'll have to keep Ivan Tony quiet, wouldn't you? And we've, <laughs> we've got a bit of history. We've got a bit of history of Ivan Tony, haven't we? So yeah, we have. Um, yeah, no, it'd be it'd be a tough game. Um, Brentford uh, are obviously showing what can be done when a club's got a clear vision and a clear um, strategy of how they're going to get to where they want to get to. Um, so they're, they're a fantastic football club, but, you know, I, I really fancy Mill to to get another top 10 finish this season. So there's no reason why Mill can't go there and, 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 and win that match. Brilliant. Oh, well, thanks again, David, for coming on the show. It's interesting <laughs> hearing I could... To be honest, we could have kept that going for at least another half an hour and talk about yeah. a lot more things. Um, yeah. But we get you back on. We cover the areas we uh, didn't yeah, cover no tonight. Problem. Anytime. No problem. Thank you. Thank okay, you, David. Guys. Thank, Thank you very much. Thanks, David. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. We will take a break there before we listen to an incredible woman's story. But first, who's a close collaborator of our Stan and Henry, Kai Bennett and his Millwall fan TV. Hello, I'm Kai. I run Millwall Fan TV. I have done for about a year and a half now. You can find me on Facebook, Instagram and Twitter. If you're just searching Millwall Fan TV, I should come up. Um, you can also find me on YouTube at Millwall Fan TV. Um, I do pretty much predictions, post-match analysis and full-time reaction. I also try to do as many interviews on ex-Millwall players. Uh, I've done about 10 so far and I've absolutely loved every minute of it. 
Thank you all so much for all your support. And if you want to subscribe to Millwall, my channel, it's Millwall Fan TV. All your support is always massively appreciated. Thank you. I'm Gary Staff and I'm back with the No One Likes a Talking Team of Henry Morgan, Dave Hart and Patricia Maslin. Great to listen to Kai. He is now reporting regularly on the online soccer journal Vavel.com. That's V-A-V-E-L.com. And with the South London Press on London News Online. Check them out. Our second guest tonight is Margaret Misden, MBE, who came to national attention in 2008. 16-year-old son, Jimmy Misden, was murdered in South East London. In the immediate aftermath, Margaret spoke of compassion for her killer rather than revenge and promised not to be beaten by Jimmy's death, believing that something good would come out of it. Drawing strength from her Catholic faith, she has since worked tirelessly with young people across the country sharing Jimmy's story in schools, pupil referral units, prison and young offenders institutes. Through the work of the charity, the Mism Foundation, Margaret and her husband Barry have created a flagship school programme that inspires individual responsibilities in young people and challenges them to work for safe, more peaceful communities. It is said that the Mizens are convinced that part of the solution is in providing more structured activities for young people. Mill will have been firmly behind this conviction, as I am. Hello, Margaret, and it's great to have you back on again. Oh, thank you very much. <laughs> it's good to be here. Yeah, lovely to speak with you, Margaret. So, Margaret, before I hand over to the panel, a good uh -huh. friend of the Mizen Foundation and Mill fan, Terry Reese, told us to of the need to change your charity arrangements. Can you uh, briefly tell us what happened in that? Oh yeah, it was a it was a really difficult time for us as a family. Um, it's a long story, and I'll just be very brief. Um, as, uh, but w we we found that with with what was going on at Four Jimmy, our charity, that we were being kind of pushed out more and more by the trustees, and um, it was a very difficult time for us, as you can imagine. And mm. the, the trustees wanted to take it down a different road to do completely different work to what we believed in. And morally, we just couldn't actually be a part of that. So we took the really hard decision to step away from for Jimmy. Um, and, and it was hard. However, we were still determined to, to do the work that we've always done in Jimmy's memory and his legacy. So we started up the Mizen Foundation. Um, I can't lie to you, it was a, a really hard time, um, but we got through it and, and, and it's going really well now. So we're, everything is the same, it's just a different name. Um, the tr trustees of the other charity were um, didn't really want us to use for Jimmy, although the name and brand belongs to us as a family. Um, but yeah, but a little bit of a hard time, but it doesn't matter now. It's all in the past and we are no. just getting on with our work. That's good. Yeah. So the difficult times, but you know, you can always get through them with, with lots of love and friends around of you. you. Of course you can. And you've certainly got through some hard times and I yeah. bow down to you for that. I wouldn't know how <laughs> to cope myself. Thank you. Uh, hi, Margaret. Hen uh, Henry here. Hi, Henry. Hi. Lovely to speak to you. Um, oh, thank I've, you. Uh, I'm actually from uh, Ball Lee High Road, so very, very local <laughs> to where you, you were, see were based. Um, and, right. and I know um, Billy quite well. I used to uh, used to have a beer with him in Blackheath every now and then after we played rugby. And I think um, Askeans, who I played for at the time, did a bit of fundraising um, a couple of seasons after um, Jimmy's death. Um, but 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 you know, sort of beyond that, May is a really special month for you due to the uh, and, and due to the restrictions that continue to exist. It doesn't make it easy for you to fundraise. Um, but mm -hmm. you've introduced twenty days in May as a fundraising project. Can you tell yeah. us a bit about that and the personal bridges challenge? Yeah, of course. Uh, obviously, m most of your listeners will know why May is important to us. It, it's it's mm. it's not just because it's the, the 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 May is the month that we lost Jimmy, but it was also his birthday. So we lost. Jimmy on the 10th of May and his birthday was the 9th of May so everything about May is important to us but so up until uh, not last year the year before we were doing the 21 bridges um, so walking 21 mm. bridges of London um, always mm. a great great time hard work I have to say um, but obviously last year we couldn't do it because of the lockdown but Kelly Webster um, and, and um, yes. was really kind and, and Ellen I, th I think arranged it um, walked the bridges for us and raised lots of money because during the lockdown obviously it's much much harder to raise money and mm. everyone's giving as it is and well yeah it's been a, financially it's been a bit of a difficult time so we 
wanted to do something this year, but we realised that we couldn't arrange the 21 bridges in full because we didn't know whether we'd be in lockdown or not, and it takes a lot of preparation. So yeah, that's when yeah. we come up with the idea of 20 days in May, as it's 2021. Um, so that's so. What we're doing is asking people to do an event around the 2021, whether it's 20 events or 21 events or one event. Um, and so lots of people are doing various different things. And as you know, Kelly Webster and her, her little team are, are walking the 21 bridges, um, and which is fantastic for us. So, so hopefully this, this month or in May, we should raise some money, uh, to keep going. Um, I myself are going to be walking from, um, Battersea Bridge to Tower Bridge, um, on the last Sunday in May. It might not sound too much, but I think I'm going to find it really hard. Um, <laughs> yeah. But it, but it, it's it's a difficult time for all charities because, as you know, um, with lockdown, so, I mean, most of our work is done in schools, and the schools will, will then fundraise to cover the cost of the the, the visit. Um, but obviously, that all stops. So, um, but it's it's difficult, as I say, for all charities. They're struggling. So, if there's a charity that's very dear to your heart, then please think about supporting them because even though the bigger charities have struggled mm -hmm. as well. They are still getting lots and lots of money. And so if, as I say, if there's a, a small charity that you love, then please think about supporting them. But for us, it's as bad as getting as many people involved in May as we can. Um, mm. and if not, then maybe just support Kelly and, watch, and her team in what they're doing. That would be fantastic. Hello, Margaret. It's Pat speaking. Um, Hi, Pat. <laughs> hello. We all look forward to Jimmy's day at the den and hopefully we'll all be back next season. Can mm -hmm. you tell us how your association with Millwall Football Club first started <laughs> and your hopes for the future, including the work with the Millwall Community Trust? Yeah, well, how did my oh, my links with Millwall started uh, when I got married? <laughs> um, <laughs> so, I, I mean, my family were, were very much Charlton supporters and Barry, when I met him, was a, was a Millwall supporter. So, as you can imagine, <laughs> I kind of had to come over to the other side just a little bit. I don't know what my dad would think. He'd probably be turning in his grave. Um, but... So Barry used to go to Millwall and then obviously he used to take our children as well. Now, some of them carried on, but in particular, our Harry continued to be a really hardened Millwall fan, as you, you probably know that anyway. And, and I suppose it all happened through that. So when Jimmy was killed, it was the day after that, I can't even remember it was, one of the directors came round to see us. Wow. And, and it kind of, mm. it, it really started from there. And then, you, you all know about Terry Reese and the amazing work yeah. he does. And Terry, I don't know, about a year after, came to see us and said that he'd like to raise money for us through his through his group. And then I don't know how, how it came about starting the Jimmy's Day, but before we knew it, we were we were having the annual Jimmy's Day. So it was arranged really by the football club and our Nikki Walford, as many of you know, we always call her Nikki too, um, and and Terry and his group and. Do you know what? I, I can't even begin to tell you how wonderful it is because the warmth that comes from us being at Millwall and the love for Jimmy is just, it, it, it brings tears to my eyes every, every time we have a Millwall, uh, a, a Jimmy's day. Um, everyone's so kind, but it does take a bit of work. But, but the, the club have been very, very supportive of it and they help us. They buy the t-shirts. So, so there's lots of support all around. Um, and we do do some work with the, uh, community, um, um, the, the Millwall Community Trust. I'd like to get involved even more if possible as time goes on because I think what they do is is fantastic. Um, lo the year before last, before the Jimmy's Day, the week before, we had a, a, gym, a, a Jimmy Mizzen Cup and it was a fantastic day with lots of schools being involved. So I'd like to see more of this work if possible. Um, but yeah, Mill Millwall do a fantastic job, but more than anything, the fans are so generous and so kind. And I think more people need to know that. Hi, Margaret. It's Dave here. Hi, Dave. It's great, great to talk to you again. <laughs> Thank you um, very much. <laughs> you've, um, you've already touched on some plans you've, you've got it lined up. Um, but what plans have you got when there's a, a better form of normality in society? Yeah, so we've been working really hard on, on where we go from here. Um, and obviously one of the big things is, is our schoolwork. 
So, uh, w uh, you know, Barry and I go into schools along with one of our sons, sharing Jimmy's story. Um, we always call it with a leg with his legacy of forgiveness, peace, and hope. So, we'd like to get into even more schools if possible. Um, we want to continue our safe haven program as well. That's where we are trying to build relationships in local communities because I think a lot of the problems going on today is this where our communities are falling down. So we're going to be continuing all of that. Um, but also we've just started up what we call the Sparkle Award and it's giving a, an award to a young person in a year six class and a year 11 class in schools. Someone who represents the kind of person that Jimmy was. Um, and we've, we've been doing it since Jimmy was killed in his secondary school. So in, we're extending that now to more schools. So this year we're hoping to do it to 10 schools locally in, in, in our area. Um, just to kind of give the young people a bit of, um, thank them for the hard work they're doing, but also, as I say, just to recognize them. Um, um we want to kind of, we also want to recognize the kind of person who maybe in some circumstances doesn't get recognized. I mean, Jimmy was very much a, the kind of person who, would have just got on with his work, probably not won too many awards, but just been a really nice person. So that's something we're working on really hard at the moment to, to kind of get that into the schools. So we're just going to keep carrying on with the work that we're doing. But as I say, getting back to normality is perhaps the hardest thing at the moment. We've been doing lots of our school work via Zoom and it's, it's so difficult. So you're talking to a, a hall full of children on a screen and, you know, it's, it's, been, it's been quite hard work. But um, yeah, so let's look forward to the normality, shall we? <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Brilliant. Um, just want to say, Margaret, I actually remember one of the first Jimmy's days because it was actually the uh, infamous 4-4, wasn't it? Oh, and, uh, gosh, yeah, I remember that. Yeah, yes. both both clubs wore different kits, didn't they? Yeah, it just Mill. Yeah. No, I in, think I, I think we both did. You're right, and I tell you, I'm going to tell yeah. you this. We put on our, our Millwall kits that we were given, and they were so tight. I felt like the Fat Family. <laughs> 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 I never forget oh, that. <laughs> yeah, I. There's a funny story about me getting to that game, but that's for another time. I think I used every form of transport to get to that game in, in the snow because it was one of those days. But yeah, brilliant. But before we go, um, obviously yeah. we asked all our guests um, a score prediction for our next game, and that's Brentford over at the Community Stadium. So what do you think? Well, I spoke to my um, to my Harry today. I asked for his, for a bit of advice, just in case you asked me that question. I wasn't sure. <laughs> And his feeling is it'll be one nil to Millwall with Jed Wallace scoring the goal. So that's my prediction. <laughs> brilliant, 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 brilliant. Uh, well, thanks, uh, Margaret. Absolute pleasure. Um, you do such a proud and amazing job. Uh, oh, and we wish you. you and all your family the best and look forward to seeing you at the den soon. Oh, In the meantime, Stan Godwin and Ted Robinson are running up and down their stairs at home in training for uh, to follow behind Kelly on the 21 <laughs> Bridges. And Fabulous. <laughs> Uh, and next week we'll be promoting more about your 20 days in May oh. on the show. Oh, thank so. you. If you just support Kelly, I'll be so grateful. It'd be wonderful. Mm -hmm. And it oh, will be always... lovely for Kelly. Yeah, we always do. She's a friend of the show. And we like to get yeah. her on quite a few times. Oh. And uh, we look forward to getting you back on again. But stay safe, Margaret. Um, it's not long to go now. We will be out yeah. of this and uh, we can start getting back down Millwall, Cholton and uh, yeah. all being friends again. Yeah, oh, thank you. Thank you for having me on. It's lovely. Bless you all. <gasps> Absolute pleasure. <laughs> Thank you. Bye bye. Bye, -bye. bye everyone. Bye, Margaret. Bye, bye. Thanks, Margaret. It's time to hear what those other sides under the Millwall banner have been up to. First up is the Millwall Romans. Let's hear from Tom Baker, who was talking to Jay Lemonius. Hello again, it's Tom Baker from the Millwall Romans and I am here today with Jay Lemonius again but in a very special excerpt because we are actually currently in the home team dugout at the Den and we're here because we've just had an amazing training session for the EFL Day of Action with Paul Robinson. Uh, we'll get onto that in a minute but first off, just to bring you the latest from our first game back at the weekend, we came out 3-2 winners at the London Titans. Jay, what was our first First game like back uh, it was excellent first and foremost I think it was just amazing to be back playing football um, I think you could tell uh, sort of the enthusiasm the buzz uh, when we arrived uh, it's not the best away trip to go to but uh, I think everybody sort of uh, turned up really excited to play uh, which isn't usually the case when we go away to, to Titans um, but yeah it was an amazing match uh, considering his first game back uh, we started off really, really well. Um, 
we were a lot sharper than I thought we'd be and um, I think actually first half we pretty much killed the game off um, really really good performance um, and yeah a lot sharper and, uh, than, than I thought we'd be so I've, we've brought Jay back because he got a hat trick at the weekend we actually went out 3-0 and then in the last 20 minutes they, they brought it back to 3-2 why Why do you think it was that they, they were able to get him back into the game and make it a nervy last last 10 minutes or so? Uh, I think it was a culmination of a couple of things. I think we made a, a couple of substitutions. Uh, I think we probably got a bit of complacent, uh, complacency in, in fitness, probably played a part as well. But yeah, made a couple of substitutions. We were well in control of the game. I don't think they had any, they didn't, they didn't really create much at all um, during sort of 70, 70 minutes of play. And, uh, we brought a few people on to get some game time, uh, get some sharpness, and I think it's just a mixture of, of complacency and, and fitness that kind of let them back in a bit. Uh, a couple of free goals, uh, I think one was meant to be a cross, and uh, keeper misjudged it a bit. But other than that, I can't think we can complain too much. Uh, naturally, we were going to tire a bit towards the end of the game, but yeah, I was still still happy with kind of the performance. And yeah, I guess we could could have predicted potentially a bit of a drop off in the last sort of 15, 20 minutes. Yeah, I, I think that's that's fair. I do think fitness played a big part um, but as we are in in the den it is worth us talking about about our session here today oh, Jay is this your first time here what do you what are your first impressions like if it is yeah really special um, really really amazing opportunity for us as a club um, it's my first time uh, at the den playing football uh, I've never been this close to the pitch uh, so yeah it's uh, it's always special when you get to, to go to grounds like this uh, historic grounds which kind of have a massive reputation and for us as a club this is huge um, we've got some uh, got loads of, sort of Millwall fans uh, where for them um, it must be an absolute dream come true um, and even just for, for the average football fan just uh, being able to kind of uh, have the opportunity to play on this turf uh, in this ground is, 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 is incredible for us and it's not one not an experience you get to experience every week Absolutely Paul did a, a session with us where um, a shooting drill which often they have on the, the Millwall Twitter uh, to try and give us all an opportunity to score at the den I didn't Jay did you <laughs> I didn't either <laughs> <laughs> unless you get goals for uh, for knocking the ball into the stands uh, I didn't score either but uh, it was still it was still loads of fun and yeah like Paul, Paul's been absolutely excellent today and again uh, another ex- incredible experience and incredible privilege to be yeah to, to be coached by by an ex fantastic player and um and, and yeah, um, a player who's held in such high esteem as with, 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 with part of the Millwall, fam- Millwall family. And lastly, Millwall have Brentford away this weekend. Tricky, tricky game, um, especially Brentford uh, finding their form, uh, beating Preston 5 0 away from home last time out. What do you think? Uh, I think it's going to be a tough match. Uh, I coming off a pretty, uh, a pretty comprehensive loss, uh, but I guess I'm going to tip them to bounce back. Um, potentially not three points, but I'll go with a, with a one or draw. Okay, I am going to commit. I'm going to sit. I'm really sorry. I'm going to say two one Brentford. <laughs> oh wow! Um, but it was a great return to the uh, league for the. Romans, but um, next up for them is the Barnes Stormers, and uh, it was great to hear they enjoyed their day at the Den. Over to you now, Pat. Millwall Lionesses played their second friendly on their return to playing football after their league was abandoned once again following government restrictions. On Saturday, Katie Whitmore's side gained another victory and a clean sheet at St Paul's. Abby Dell looks to be on fire as she added two more goals to her tally from the previous week as the Lionesses ran out five goals to nil victors against Upton Park Ladies. Wednesday night saw the Lionesses go to Dartford to face Kent Football United. I then spoke to assistant manager Alex Russell. Alex, after a battling performance from the Lionesses last night against a very good and determined Kent Football United, how do you think the game went? Yeah, I, I think the game went well. I think going up against a side that are two tiers higher than you is always difficult. I, I think that golf in, in quality in playing from six to four is is a, is a big jump as opposed to, for example, nine to seven or, or eight to six. I think that, that that gap is a big jump. But I think the girls demonstrated that there's no reason why they can't look towards that in the near future. Maybe not right away, but definitely competed for large parts of the game. You know, Kent scored early and they scored late. So we demonstrated that from that third minute onwards, 
yes, we you know we were a little bit asleep, but we demonstrated, like I say, that we we could compete, and we were in that game for a large proportion of it, um, coming close with a few chances of our own, whilst dealing with what came through us. Millie Carter was exceptional in the Millwall goal last night and had an outstanding game. How pleased were you with her performance? Yeah, Millie, as per you know, Millie Carter being superb, you could say water is wet. It is, it, you, we say it every week. Um, it it really does install. I can't even describe how much confidence it must install into the back five in front of her. I think we like to Katie and I try to sort of implore that we play play out from the back. So you're going to be a little bit more risky with what you try in terms of you know playing out from the back and inviting pressure is is difficult at any level. But doing it against a, a Kent Football United, having Millie Carter <coughs> behind you means you you're that little bit more confident in that pass because you know. If it doesn't go to plan, she'll bow you out nine times out of ten. Um, and she did. She was exceptional from, from start to finish um, and, and kept the scoreline, as we've said, very respectable. I think 2-0 against a Kent isn't isn't bad at all. And I don't think that she'd just let her head drop for either of the goals. They were very well taken goals um, and very well rehearsed. And it's something that we can learn from and hopefully won't be conceding goals at that again. Yeah, I agree. Kent were a real test. But where do you think the game was lost for us, aside from the goals, of course? Yeah, Kent was definitely a real test. I think someone like Amy Russ, for example, there, there were moments in the game, I'm, I'm instructing the defence, show her onto her left. She shifts it onto her left and a shot that's going into the top corner from 25 yards. Like Having a player like that in your midfield, is that would be pivotal to any side. So I, I think, you know, in hindsight, maybe we should have added another player into the midfield. Um whether that be dropping one from up top and going to two up top and, and going three in the middle, playing fairly sort of narrow with your wing backs offering your width, or whether that be a four three three or a four five one. I think probably that's where we should have matched them up in midfield. Because a lot of their attacks came from down that central sort of channel. But I think going one nil down early was always hard because you always give yourself sort of a mountain to climb early on. But like I said, I think the girls handled what was thrown at them and the first goal is 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 sloppy to concede. It is it is a set piece, but you know it's one it's one of those things. It's we've been away from football for so long. We haven't had too much time to rehearse and and plan on on defending those set pieces. So yeah, it's caught us up. It's caught us out rather. But I'm sure the girls will dust themselves down, work on it, review it, watch the footage, and we'll go again. Um, like I say, other than that, I think we, we restricted them to shots from range. I think. It's, it's something that we've been working on, you know, sort of like like Sam said in his interview, um, the Kent Football United manager, we, we defended in a low block and I think it it worked for, like I say, large portions of the game. But no, definitely, I think the midfield was a bit of a rotational. We didn't have Libby in there, um, who would normally be sort of commanding who should be where, here, there and everywhere. Um, but other than that, that's, yeah, that's a testament to Kent, you know, that they are a tier four side for a reason. Amy Russ, for example... Um, pulling the strings out there. Um, finally, Alex, have these friendlies made you see enough from this Millwall side as we look ahead to next season? Yeah, I think these friendlies have been a really good opportunity for Katie and I to see what we have, what we're missing, what our strengths are and what our weaknesses are. I think having two, on paper, easier fixtures with all due respect to Upton and Hackney um, gave us a chance to sort of have the players playing with confidence, have the players show us what they can do when sort of they have the opportunity to. I think going up against Kent, it was a little bit of a, a reality check. You know, it stopped us getting too high and too above our stations. And then we look ahead to Billericay next week. And I think that Billericay would be a real good opposition. They faced Kent Football United recently also. I think they've got a really good setup over there. So they'll be a well-drilled side and, and a, a side to really sort of test ourselves against. But no, definitely, I think that these these friendlies have been class in terms of observing and, and sort of trying to work out where we are as a club, where we need to add, and um, sort of unfortunately, where, where players perhaps need to move on from. Thanks, we'll take a break there. But for now, here's a great story. It is born out of the passing of a goal, keeping style of women's football, Jordan Dawes and her cousin's effort to raise money in her memory. Hi, Bethany Warren here. Millwall fans Danielle and James will be running the London Landmark Half Marathon in August in memory of Danielle's cousin, Jordan Dawes. 
listen to Danielle tell her story. Hello. So I am running the London Landmark Half Marathon in August. While training for Tough Mudder, which I'm doing in September, I feel I got the bug for running. I wanted to give myself a challenge and while raising money for Eleanor. Jordan's memory lives on forever and as a family, we honour her memory by giving back to the charity that gave their care and support during the darkest of times. Jordan lost her battle to cancer in 2019. She was a keen footballer, playing for the likes of Charlton Athletic, Dillingham and ending her football career at Kent Football United. One of the most memorable times for me and the family when watching Jordan play was when she actually saved a penalty in a cup final leading Kent Football United to win. She was an infectious person to be around. Her smile lit up the room. She was keen in talking to James about Millwall. She would come with us as of when she can. And the last game that she actually went to was the FA Cup game against Everton, where Millwall actually spoilt her, made her feel really special. She was able to meet some of the players, have her pictures taken with the keeper at the time, and was actually given the treatment of being able to go into the exec lounge as well. Uh, the way that people can donate, and we really would appreciate if anyone can, big, small, whatever it is, is through my pinned tweet on Twitter. My Twitter handle is DannyL1206, and that is D-A-N-N-I, capital L, 1206. Or you can go through Just Giving website, that is justgiving.com forward slash raising forward slash Jordan George Half Marathon. Just want to thank everyone for taking the time to listen and anyone that donates. So thank you. What a story and what a lovely couple Danielle and James are in doing this together. So if you can help, you can just put James and Danielle fundraising for Eleanor. That is E-L-L-E-N-O-R into your browser and the Just Giving page will be shown. I'll say that again. Just put James and Danielle fundraising for Eleanor. That is E-L-L-E-N-O-R into your browser and the Just Giving page will be shown. Thank you. A link will also be in our announcements on Facebook and Twitter. I'm Gary Staff and I'm back with the No One Likes Us Talking team of Henry Morgan, Dave Hart and Patricia Maslin. Danielle and James, I wholly salute you and keep up the good work. Well done to you both. Our final guest this evening is the Chief Executive of Millwall Communities Trust, Sean Daly. Hello again, Sean. I hope things are well with you. Good evening. Hope you're all well. Good yeah. evening, Sean. Good evening. Good evening. Evening, Sean. Henry here, mate. Um, how, how are you, Henry? Yeah, not bad, mate. Great to speak to you again. Um, busy week this week with the launch of the Bursary Fund and obviously the uh, EFL Day of Action. Can you tell us about your involvement in that Day of Action? Yeah, it's, it's a thing that the EFL um, do every year where they want um, all the clubs and the trust to sort of like showcase the work they do day to day. Mm. Um and they came to us about a month ago and sort of said, look, could you showcase something that the trust and the club are doing um, regular or, or around yeah. now? Yeah. Um, but I knew that most clubs would be sort of latching on to the COVID-19 situation of what they're doing, you know, yeah. free holiday yeah. camps, um, supporting the community. And I wanted to get something different. I thought, you know, I want to showcase Millwall, Millwall's family and what we do around inclusivity and et cetera. So mm. spoke with Billy at the club and said, look, I don't really want to show much around what we've been doing with COVID. That, that's been highlighted enough, I think. Um, I'd like to have the pitch and I'd like to have a sort of a coaching session with the Romans on there and sort of show the diverse work that we're doing and reflecting our community, really. And Billy and the, the club just bought into it straight away. Um, I said, I'd like to get someone, you know, a legend to coach if possible. And... Robbo came forward and said, look, I'd love to be involved in it. And that was it, really. We just, um, they spent the afternoon at the den coaching, uh, listening to stories about from Paul about his, his journey at Millwall. Um, it was a great day, really great day. But I just wanted to sh sort of show something different because um, I knew yeah. everyone else yeah. would be showing, you know, their support around COVID. And we've had loads of profile around that, about the NHS and, I just wanted to show something different. I wanted to show our family, really, and what we're doing. Yeah, it's a great idea. The Bursary Fund is a great opportunity for young people generally. What would the fund support? When we see donations, and, and I, I talk a lot about, you know, that 
how the fans and the club have supported the trust. And, you know, I'll get the odd donation here and there or or someone will ring us up and say, you know, can I help you with any support? And with everything that's gone on with the pandemic, you know, young people are going to really suffer, I think, in the next six months, a year, two years, where, you know, they're, they're going to struggle to get into an employment, they're going to struggle to get into college, they're going to struggle to get into work, etc. And what I wanted to use the bursary for was, was to support those young people. Not not major support, them, as in, um, you know, thousands and thousands of pounds, but sort of be able to sort of say, well, you know, if we can help you get over a certain barrier, we will. And I've spoken to a lot of young people. Before I launched it, I spoke to a lot of young people and said, you know, what barriers do you have to get you through certain things, you know? And people say, like, you know, I'm going for an interview for a job, I haven't got a suit. Well, I'd like to fund something like that. So he, that young person builds their confidence and is able to go for an interview and feel he's a part and he, he deserves that job. And, you know, things like, you know, transport for someone to go for an interview or go to a college interview or get to to get to work or anything like that. I want to try and support things like that to get them over the certain barriers they're going to gonna get. And what I felt during the, the COVID, I, I realised, you know, how many young people haven't got technology that, um, like laptops or phones. How can we support them? Because technology has taken the world. So I really just want to just to support young people getting over a certain barrier that may give them that confidence to go a little bit further in their life. Things that we we just have all the time, those young people haven't got it. So I want to try and support them that way. Uh, great work, great work. We have produced a new advert highlighting the bursary fund, which you can hear later. Oh, thank you very much. Great, Sean. Um, short and sweet, but the work you do is never that. And um, we appreciate, and of course, you're a big uh, fan of our show. And we obviously a fan of all the work you do. So thank you again for everything you do. And uh, I hope the Bursary Fund is a real good success for the uh, Community Trust. No, thank you for all your support. Thank you. No problem. Thank you, Sean, for that brief. Uh, but Brentford up next. What do you think? Uh, I, th I think Norwich and Brentford are the, the best two teams in the league. Uh, my heart's saying I'd love a draw. I, I just, but my head's telling me that uh, we may get beaten because uh, they're, they're playing some great football, Brentford. I think they're going to be very hard to stop. They're on a roll at the moment, so I think possibly we may lose one or two nil. Well, uh, it's been fifty-fifty on the uh, predictions tonight, so uh, we'll see how it goes on Saturday. Uh, but thanks again, Sean. Keep up the great work and uh, goodbye. Thanks very much, everyone. Thank you for all your support. Cheers. Bye, Sean. Thanks, Sean. Cheers, Sean. Great. Well, it's time to look ahead to uh, what's coming up next for our Lions. But first, we'll hear from that Twitter and Facebook video sensation, Ellis Barr. Hi, everyone. Ellis here. Thank you for watching my videos. And thank you for all that you put. But now it's time to look ahead to your next match. Come on, Newell! Gets me every time. Thanks, Alice. You are so well and our introducing star. So next up is our Henry Stato Morgan. Uh, he met up with Billy Grant, a.k.a. Billy the Bee, as the fan of the op opposition. Let's hear what they have to say ahead of Saturday's game. Welcome to View from the Opposition. This evening we're talking to Brentford and England fan Billy Grant from the Besotted Pride of West London podcast. Welcome, Billy. Right, Henry, how you doing, mate? Uh, yeah, not too bad. Not great after last weekend's game where I think there's, it looks like there's an eight-goal swing towards uh, Brentford with us losing 3-0 and you winning five, right, up at Preston, is that right? That's right, yeah. It was a good weekend for us, to be quite honest with you. Um, yeah, well, look, Brentford this season, uh, 120, lost seven, drawn 13. I noticed that only Norwich and Watford have lost the same or fewer games than you. These are the numbers. What's the actual story of your season so far? It's quite interesting because I've never actually looked at our season like that and on a whole over the whole season. And actually, when you look at it like that, it looks quite good. I mean, everyone yeah. remembers us for last season, the fact that we got to the playoff final yes. and we lost in the last 
out the last few minutes to the the F word, which I can't actually really say <laughs> at all, actually, because it's a bit of a West London rivalry thing. But yeah, it's quite yeah. bad to have lost to them lot in the playoff final. However, you know, I'll be honest with you. Um, you know, it was it was a gutter because also we had a great team last season. Yes. We had, you know, Ollie Watkins, we had Ben yes. Rama, we had the Boom Boomo was firing, we had Justice Silver who's firing, we had a, yeah. the second tightest defence in the league. And to be quite honest with you, and I'm gonna say this for now, that you know, in principle we shouldn't have got, we should not have um you know, we should not have well, we shouldn't have even finished third. We didn't. So what Thomas Frank has done this season, he's decided, tell you what, let's be a lot more practical about the way we go about our football. Okay. Let's try and cut out these problems where we're not going to be losing these one nil games and you know and and let's go for it. So this season we've been playing some good football. I'll be honest with you, we don't yeah. look nearly as pretty as we did last season. Who do Wall need to look out for this weekend? Ivan Tony, obviously he scored in the return fixture at the den early. I can't believe it was back in September now. Um who else do we need to be wary of? We took a player who has been playing so-so up front as a winger, Brian Mbumo, who's actually a winger, you know and we put him at left-back. And he was a revelation at left-back because all of a sudden yeah, that, okay. that brought back our wing-back play and we were fantastic against P&E as well. And also Christian Norgard, who is normally our CDM, we put yes. him into the centre yes. of defence. We, okay. we did a three-man defence, which was a lot more mobile as well. Yeah. And he was absolutely brilliant in the centre of defence. So... Those are two players that I say that you should look out for okay. um, in, in particular because they're they're two. I mean, the whole team. I love the whole team. You can hear me gushing about them. <laughs> I'm just I'm pointing these two players out because they've been quite instrumental in the way that we've actually you know managed to turn things around at Preston and also Fosu as well, who's normally a left winger. He he doesn't normally get a start, but we started him on Saturday, and he also was given a bit more of a free role. So he was actually doing quite a lot of things, very creative things as well as yes. a free role in the midfield. So I'm asking you to look out for these three players who are probably slightly different um, than people would normally say to you. you should look out for you know Pontus Janssen or you know yeah. Josh Silva or whoever else like that. But okay. yeah, check them out. Okay, is there anyone uh, that Brentford will be particularly wary of coming into the game? And it's interesting. I mean, your goalkeeper is it Bill 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 Yes, yes. He, he always. Um, oh, oh, I think he's a, yeah. quite a good goal, goalkeeper as well. Was was he at Reading? I'm not sure if he's at Reading. Uh, Reading Ipswich. Or, I can't oh, Ipswich, Ipswich. That's right. Yeah. He was at Ipswich, man, and he was wicked. He was wicked at Ipswich. He was. And then he came to Millwall and again and again. I don't know if it's just against us, but he seems to have some really good games against us. So I do rate your goalkeeper as well. I noticed that Marlon Romeo isn't playing as much as he should do. I thought that he was a really I good up and coming player. Very I've good heard player. there's a bit of activity that's been happening down at Millwall it seems to have been sort of kind of sidelining him which is a little bit sad because uh, yeah, well you know the guy's sticking up for what he believes in which is what I believe in because I'm a black football supporter and uh, I believe in exactly the same thing that Marlon believes in as well so it seems like a bit of a shame that he's been sidelined for uh, well for being a black footballer but anyway we should move on from that yeah, as yeah, well no, and you. also who else who else is there as well and there is um, Ryan Woods we loved Woodsy at Brentford we were gutted Absolutely gutted when he left Brentford. So, uh, so that will that will do for me. Have you got a score prediction for us? What, what do you think? Especially after last weekend, I think I'm, I'm feeling slightly more pessimistic uh, than I um, think I was before that Swansea game. Um, I'm going to go for the two nil for the mighty mighty bees. Billy, thank you so much for coming on. Um, look forward to maybe trying to catch up post match and review the game. If your game, we're game. Yeah, definitely. A nice one, Henry. And good luck to, to Millwall. Good luck to all the Millwall fans out there. I hope you have a, a, a decent season, a good season after you play us, of course. <laughs> like you. Good luck. Good luck for the rest of the season. Cheers, mate. And you? I've got a prediction of Brentford 1, Millwall 2 from Carla Mari Howes of the Facebook site Millwall Fans Home and Away. Check this out. Uh, and thank you very much, Carla. Thanks, guys. And thanks again, Henry. Um, um... And it was back in September, as the guys mentioned, when an unusual headed goal from Jed Wallace. I uh, watched it again in the week, and it was an amazing build-up. I think it was about 20 or so passes that uh, mm -hmm. led to that goal as well. Um, and then it was cancelled out by our nemesis, Ivan Tony, and it was a 1-1 draw. Bees are flying high. Guys, uh, I know, Henry, you just said that, but I'll go to you first. What do you expect from the game, really? Uh, yeah, I, I, I do worry with Hutch not being in there more than anything else that... Um, we, you know, we we obviously look quite vulnerable against the Swansea side that weren't firing, and Brentford have got five goals 
the week before up at Preston, who had been on the turn. Um, but, you know, the one thing I would say is this is the championship and actually uh, anything can happen, especially as, you know, our away form puts us in, I think, the top six teams in the division. So probably more confident than if we were playing them at home. So um, I went for a, I think I went for a 2-1 victory uh, against Swansea. So I'm going to go for a 1-0 victory. I think Mason Bennett's going to score. I'll take that. Um, David? Yeah, I totally agree with what uh, Henry said there. Um, no Hutchinson in the back, back line. Um, Brentford is scoring goals for fun. Um, I think the best we can get on the day would be a nil-nil draw. Indeed. And over to you, Pat. I have to concur with the other two about missing Hutchinson. Um, if there's one team in the championship you've got to admire, it's Brentford. I mean, what a team. And you look at the others up there, they've all got parachute payments to fall back on. Brentford just have a knack of getting these players from like small teams and they've got a really good side. Beat Preston 5-0 last week. Absolute drubbing for them. <laughs> yeah, I mean... Yeah. Uh, head says, yes, we could do it, but heart knows we're not going to. Fair enough. But you say about Hutchinson, I know they play Pierce in there, but I don't think he's not mobile enough for the no. teams we're playing at the moment. I'd probably put Evans in there and maybe bring Woods back into the middle for a bit of a... Yeah, I, I think Pierce has reached that Morrison stage yeah. where I you're guess, just yeah. not quite good enough for that division. Yeah, yeah I agree. Mm. Okay, and I'll go um, a 1-1 one, one as well. We move on um, to next Wednesday with a, a strange 6 o'clock kickoff um, at the Den when we entertain Bournemouth. Mm. Uh, you remember the verse fixture at Dean Court, which I remember was a gripping game. Uh, Jed Wallace blew a one-on-one -on -one, um, with another one headed off the line and a Jed hit a fine free kick. They brought a great save from their keeper. But then they scored just before half-time through Solanke. In the second half, Zahor hit the post from a free kick but then Smith equalised, and we thought we'd thrown it all away when uh, the Cherries grabbed a late winner, but it was ruled out. Do you think we can do better on Wednesday at the Den? Um, I'll go to Dave first on that one. Bournemouth for one of these teams that um, on the day they can probably beat anybody, but they're beginning to slip up a little bit, which has mean that Brentford, Swansea are picking up on their, their slips. So I'm going to go... For a Millwall win, 2-1, with uh, Bennett and Jed scoring out two goals. Okie dokes. And then on to Pat. Yeah, another hard game. They'll be fighting for their lives, trying to keep in those playoffs. Um, a game, I'd, I know it's a hard game, but I'd love to see some of the youngsters out there again. We're not the home team we used to be. Uh, mm. because of how the season's panned out um, I think we'd be lucky with a draw mm. and then Henry uh, yeah I, I agree with Pat I think Bournemouth looking at looking at the stats as I love to do um, a fourth in the in the form table in terms of away from home and we're in the bottom four we got no fans in the ground we got tired players we got injuries um, we got people looking for beach towels. We got people wanting to leave the club. You know, it, it, it's yeah. I, I can't. Uh, Bournemouth have still kept the majority of the core of their team, and I, you know, I think it's going to be a really tough game for us to get anything out of. And I think the draws, you know, obviously the draws not the best we can hope for because if we do turn it on and play a game like we did against Preston or against you know one of those away performances at home and turn it on. Uh, we could do all right, but yeah, I, I think a draw feels for me probably the the the, the best result. Let's just get the quick fire results. Dave, what was your score in there again? Two one to Millwall. Two one, Patricia. Okay, nil nil. Henry, oh, I was, was going to go nil nil as well, Pat. Right, I'll go one all. <laughs> yeah. And then I'll go for a Desmond uh, a two two. Yeah. <laughs> so don't forget, you can hear, as we mentioned earlier on, that um, 
Henry will be reviewing the match at the weekend. Links will be available on our social media sites and Spreaker. We'll take a break there for a new message from Patricia Maslin with an introduction from that Millwall hero, Harvey Brown. Harvey Brown here. I miss my football at the bin. Did you know Millwall Community Trust are continuing to help people of all ages from different walks of life and are doing so much good in these tough times, but they need our help. Here's Patricia to tell you more. Oh, thank you for that intro, Harvey. Millwall Community Trust appreciates your support. You are a star. The Millwall Community Trust, MCT, have launched a bursary fund this week to tackle financial hardships. The bursary fund has been put in place as an initiative to aid individuals participating in an MCT activity or programme. The funds will be awarded to help further an individual's career and potential at MCT, whilst also supporting continued participation in MCT programmes. Sean Daly, CEO of the Trust, said, Funds raised from our fundraising events and donations from supporters of the Trust will support the MCT's bursary, which will in turn offer financial support to participants on our programmes. For example, helping with travel expenses so they can attend, providing clothing for young people, and working with or paying for a haircut for an interview. The Trust is excited to provide this opportunity to the local community. Through all the funding and donations, support will be provided to those who need it. Jubin Sarami, who was part of the initial fundraiser for the fund, said, it was amazing to be able to raise funds for and launch our bursary fund. We achieved this with support from our amazing fans who took part in a month-long virtual race around Europe between all the host Euro 2020 cities. Our fantastic fans ran, cycled and walked nearly 6,000 miles. Thanks to them, we were able to smash our fundraising target. The bursary fund will be open to all participants of Millwall Community Trust programmes. The scheme has been set up to help support participants to take part in our programme and help them achieve their goal without finances being a barrier. We are really excited to launch a project and will always welcome donations. For further information about the bursary, please email Sean Daly, that is sdaily at millcommunity.org.uk. I'll spell that out. That is S-D-A-L-Y at Millwall Community, or one word, dot org dot UK. If you wish to make any donations, insert Millwall Community Trust into your internet browser, click on Donate, either on the browser page or on the header of the MCT website. Thank you. I'm Gary Staff and I'm back with the No One Likes a Talking team of Henry Morgan, Dave Hart and who you've just heard from, Patricia Maslin. People are still losing their lives to this dreadful virus or as a consequence of suffering from it. High levels of infection remain with us and many people continue to be hospitalised too. Our thoughts go out to the victims, their families, friends and those who take care of them. There are so many fans who want to support the club and you can help by joining the Lions Loyalty Club. It costs £40 with benefits or by making a donation when you renew your season ticket. For £25, you or a member of your family can also be a crowdie. Mm -hmm. And why not sponsor a player's kit at a discounted rate with benefits? You can also obtain a virtual mascot package for £104. Also, watch out for virtual map sponsorship packages, which you can purchase from the Millwall Commercial Department. All the details and more can be found on the Millwall website. Lastly, don't forget, I follow returns to our screens with Carl Bates and Max McLellan this Saturday at 12.30, where we face Brentford at their new stadium. 100% of what you pay, less taxes, for the internet streaming service, home and away, goes back to Millwall Football Club. What a wonderful way to improve their revenue during these challenging times. It's a good night from me. Next Friday, Henry hosts the Rose Between Two Thorns show with Stan Godwin, Bethany Warren and Jeff Burnage. In the meantime, Scott Johnson, the founder of the Proper Blokes Club, 
is still looking for guys to come along and join him to break the stigma of men's mental health with the walk and talk groups. Walks now take place on Thursdays and Sundays, once again from HMS Belfast. Check out the Proper Blokes Club on Twitter and Facebook for further details. And that's good night from me. And don't forget, Millwall Lionesses and Romans are now playing football under the current restrictions. Nevertheless, these games are not currently open to fans. The Lionesses are holding open training sessions for prospective new first team players. These commenced on the 7th of April. You will need to register interest on a form to attend. These are available on their Facebook or Twitter sites. Millwall Romans return to playing and training. Potential joiners are welcome. Make contact through either their Facebook or Twitter pages. Both teams train and play their home games at the excellently managed Millwall Community Trust site at St Paul Sports Grand, Salter Road, Rotherhive, and you could be playing there too. Good night. Lastly, let's not forget to keep it safe on the streets out there. Follow the lockdown guidance, social distancing and a face burst when necessary. That's it from me. Thanks, Henry, Dave and Patricia. Until next time, good night.